Well, um, this is a Miro board that I'm going to be using for the purpose of this presentation today. And uh, actually, when I was sending out my newsletter and posting on Twitter that I was going to be doing, giving this presentation, <laughs> one of the questions I kept getting was, what have you used to, uh, to create this diagram? And so this is Miro, Miro or Miro. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, this is my first time using this tool. It's something I came across fairly recently. I've just seen it kind of online, a few people using it. And uh, actually, I've heard it sponsoring a few podcasts as well. And so I thought it'd be quite an interesting tool to try out for the purpose of this presentation. So rather than going through a slideshow, I've tried to map everything out and I've got some notes in here. I'll put this all up into a blog post at the end. And if people do want, I'll, maybe I'll include a link to this board as well. If people want to view the uh, public link, I'll, I'll include a link to this Miro board at the end. But uh, yeah, I actually just want to start by saying I had quite a... I quite enjoyed using this tool to actually map out my process and it was quite an interesting process to go through. So if this looks complicated and uh, messy, uh, hopefully my goal by the end of this is that it will become a bit clearer. So I'm going to go through this diagram and I'm going to start by talking about my website. I guess because for most of us, the website Oh, your website is kind of the hub or the, the first, I guess, tool in the chain, the first link in the chain that often a lot of things connect to. So my website is built, I'm looking at these notes up here, my website is built on WordPress. Uh, obviously some alternatives are things like Squarespace and uh, there's other ones out there as well. I've been using WordPress since the beginning. Uh, there's a lot of support for WordPress in terms of developers who can help and uh, plugins and things as well. So my uh, hosting, because you do have, if you are, if you do have a WordPress website, a WordPress.org website, you have to kind of provide your own hosting. So I use Cloudways. Um, I didn't even find Cloudways. Cloudways is a service that a developer who was optimizing my website for me a few years ago, he recommended it, said it was good for kind of speed and performance. So I, I use Cloudways for hosting. And with my website, I use all the uh, normal kind of features really. So for things like all the pages on my website, let me bring up my uh, website as I'm going through here. So for things like, you know, the front end pages, like my about page, my consulting page, where I've got information about what I do, these pages, uh, this resource page, for example, all of these pages are created using the pages feature in WordPress. So the pages, yeah, if, if you're a WordPress user, you're probably familiar with this, but I can basically create a page for the different pages on my website. Um, kind of sounds obvious. So I've got my home page, my about page, my blog, consulting. So a lot of the pages are built just using this feature. So, you know, if I click into the about page, uh, which is this one here. So here's the, here's the content, you know, I've got my nice smiling face some logos and some blog posts and things. Um, this is kind of what it looks like in the back end. Uh, I can change the copy. Um, I can put in links. So WordPress makes it really simple and easy to control the content on my website with the blog. Uh, so if I go to my blog page, this is all managed through the posts section. So if you're new to WordPress or you're not familiar with posts, these are basically the articles that I write that get added to this feed. So this is just a feed that gets updated. So when I write a new uh, article or piece of content, it kind of joins the top of the feed. And so if I look at uh, a post that I wrote recently, it's okay to waste time. This is kind of what it looks like in the back end. So I can write all my content. I can embed my podcast, um, my podcast player. I can include links, include photos and things like that. A couple of plugins that I do use as well. Um, so I use the Yoast SEO plugin. This is a very popular one. Uh, if I do want to control things like the, um, the headline and the description of my post, I don't do it so much on blog posts, but I do use this on more of the pages that I have. So Yoast SEO is a nice plugin that I use to control some of the, the SEO features. I also use social warfare, which is how I have these social buttons. Um, I, I just quite like the design of these social buttons. And so this is provided via the social warfare plugin. And so I can design my content and on the right hand side, you've kind of got all the metadata. So I can choose what category uh, I'm posting in. So with, with WordPress, here are my categories. These are the different topics that I talk about. And so I can say, right, this is part of the productivity category, but it's also part of the podcast as well. So I kind of, I, index it into both category, categories. I can put my tags down here, include features images, featured images. So this is where I control all of the, the content that goes into that post. 
I do also use a plugin called Optimize Press for some of the product pages that I have. So you may have seen before on my website, if I go to this consulting page, if I go to Asana Consulting, this is a slightly different page where it, it looks the same. Actually, the header looks the same, but the layout of the page is quite different. I've got these different blocks. I've got embedded videos. I have these um, sections for explaining the modules. Um, I've got pricing tables down here uh, and these different kind of wider sections as well. So for these pages on my website, which really are for my promoting my consulting services or things like these product pages, if I go to the personal productivity toolkit, <clears throat> these pages that are, I would say kind of more, they have more of a design to them. These are actually created using the Optimize Press uh, plugin. So if I go to the back end, I'm actually using a pretty old version of Optimize Press. Optimize Press has been updated um, more recently. I haven't actually updated the plugin. Um, it would involve actually recreating a lot of my pages and it's just working well for now. So I, I sort of have no requirement to update it. But Optimize Press, yeah, it's, it's a really nice page builder. So if I go to, let's say the PPT, if I go to the, this toolkit page, rather than creating the page using the WordPress builder, like I normally do with the about page, I can use Optimize Press and they have this live editor. So if I launch the live editor, it looks like this. It kind of looks like how it does on the front end, but I can click on these sections and I can edit the content and change the copy. I can put in images. I can add elements as well if I want to um, add a uh, special arrows or you know, different elements to the page. Optimize Press is this really nice page builder that um, lets me just kind of control the, the content of the page a lot more. So I use uh, a combination of WordPress and Optimize Press, Optimize Press for actually building my website. Uh, and backups as well. Um, backups of my website are stored on the server. So Cloudways do keep a backup of my site. I also do use um, Vault Press as well. So actually let's just go to my back end again. Vault Press I think is down here somewhere. Uh, maybe it's in, gosh, I don't even know where it is now. Settings, oh, I don't even know where it is now. There'll be, a, <laughs> there'll be a tab somewhere in here. Vault Press is a service provided by, it's actually made by WordPress. I think it's about $3 a month or something like that. It's, it's very cheap and it allows me to make an extra backup. Um, so I just like having multiple backups of my website. I have also had to restore from a backup uh, a couple of times in the past and Vault Press makes it really easy to just look at a recent version of my site. They keep daily backups so I can say, yep, revert to a backup from yesterday. So I just really like the user interface of Vault Press and so I use that for backups. So that's the first kind of piece of the puzzle here is my website, which is all uh, set up using WordPress. Next, um, I'll, I'll move over here and I'll talk about my e-commerce system, which is all run through a plugin called Easy Digital Downloads. So EDD is, I have this downloads tab in WordPress where I can set up all my downloads. So if I go to downloads, a download is basically a product or a service. So for a lot of my courses or basically all of the courses and products that I sell, so like Master Pipe Drive, Master Asana, delivering book summaries, my toolkits, my consulting programs, they are all delivered through, uh, they are all set up as downloads here in, um, in EDD. And so what you see on the front end, these pricing tables, I designed the pricing table in Optimize Press using the plugin that I showed you before. But these buttons here, if you actually look down the very bottom of my screen, you see the link there. It says poolminers.com slash checkout. And it's got this uh, question mark EDD action. What this link does is it adds the product to the checkout. So if I click this uh, add to cart, it puts this in the checkout and this checkout is created through the easy digital downloads uh, plugin. So there we go, I've added my product to the cart. I can then choose my payment method. So uh, credit card or PayPal, obviously if they pay through credit card, either this will get paid and processed through Stripe. So I'm now looking here in my diagram. So payments go through Stripe or PayPal. Or there is a Bitcoin option. Actually, I've had very few people pay me via Bitcoin. 
Unfortunately, I would like more people to use it, <laughs> but uh, that is another option as well. It doesn't get used that much. And so those payouts come through, yeah, credit card or PayPal. And so this, uh, this, all this back end, this um, e-commerce system is all run through easy digital downloads. Let me just go to my notes over here. And actually, let me just check out this uh, link here. The nice thing about easy digital downloads compared to some other e-commerce providers is they don't take a percentage of your uh, sale. Some of the other ones that I've looked at, they take like a percentage, like, right, we take a, a small commission. Other ones have a monthly fee that, um, you know, it's just another expense. What, I mean, I was getting started about uh, five or six years ago. And EDD was a nice, affordable way to get started, and it's just served me well ever since. But you don't actually pay a subscription to EDD. You can start with it for free, and you can take payments through PayPal. But then what they do sell is these add-ons or these passes. So you can pay yearly, and you get access to a number of um, additional e-commerce features. So for example, taking payments through Stripe is something that requires uh, an add-on. So they have a bunch of these add-ons like, so yeah, to take Stripe payments, I have to pay for one of these subscriptions or I can buy the Stripe add-on individually for a, for a premium price. Same thing with like selling subscriptions. If I want to take recurring payments, I have to pay for an additional add-on. So I can either pay for their add-ons individually or I can buy one of these passes. I think I get the, I'm either on the extended or the professional, it might be the professional. So I pay about $300 a year, but that's for all of my e-commerce, for all of the add-ons that I use. And I use quite a lot. So if I go to one of my, if I go to my plugins here, um, let's have a look at what I've got. So here are all my plugins. So I have the, this is the core EDD plugin, but I have additional add-ons for things like taking Bitcoin payments, conditional gateways for restricting content on my website, connecting to ConvertKit, managing upsells, you see, I actually use quite a lot of their add-ons. So that's basically what I'm paying for as part of this professional pass is those additional features that um, you can get access to. Um, so EDD manages all of the things like receipts uh, that get sent to customers and download links as well. So if I have a look at, um, let's go to one of my products. So let's go to, this is my master Asana program. So I can set up my pricing here. So I've got, you know, monthly and unlimited options. I can set up the prices for each option. And then down here I can set up, okay, if they buy a certain option, what do they get access to? So with all of the price options, they get access to the course. And with certain options, they get access to my Calendly link to book private calls and things with me as well. And that's the other thing I quite like about EDD is that the entire, um, back end and managing all my products all still happens here in WordPress. I don't have to log into a completely separate platform like Kajabi to manage my products and see my sales. Everything is kind of housed under my WordPress back end. I can see everything in one place, uh, which is which is really nice. And so yeah, I can set up my my download links. These get automatically emailed to customers when they purchase. And for a few of my products like my Master Asana course, um for things like my Master Asana course, uh, there is a recurring payment option. And so, yeah, like I said before, I can set up recurring payments as part of the, um, the product. That's using one of the add-ons here. So here's the monthly option. I can say this is recurring every month. And so I can set that to repeat. And so moving on to the actual courses that I sell, um, my all my products like my toolkit, my consulting program, my master Asana and master pipe drive courses, they are all delivered through my website as well. So I actually have, um, if I go to the dashboard and I'll go to the front end as well, master Asana. So this is what my course dashboard looks like when you sign up to the program, this is the course dashboard. I can see all of the lessons that I can access to. Now, how I restrict access to this is using one of the easy digital download add-ons, which allows me to restrict content. So uh, if I go to the, the back end here, this is now in WordPress, this is the page that I've created to create this dashboard. With, uh, if I go to, here we go, content restriction, 
I can choose to restrict this page to active subscribers and they have to download the master or they have to subscribe to the master Asana program. So if you, if I sent you this link now and you try to access the page, you wouldn't be able to access the page unless you are logged into the course um, with a valid active subscription. And Andrew, uh, is the course itself just a hidden page on your website? Yeah, um, so it's, it's not technically hidden. It's, uh, it is restricted, yeah. So if I actually show you on the front end, um, if I go to an incognito window, so if I go to that page now, this is what it would look like if you try to access the page. You basically either have to, you can click here to go and join the program, or you can log in. So customers can log in and it will take you to the course, uh, to this page. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. And a nice little, another plugin that I've um, installed into WordPress that allows me to help customers track their progress through the course is a plugin called WP Complete. So you see how some of these lessons have been checked off here. Um, I actually came across this plugin, WP Complete, uh, when I signed up to Paul Jarvis's program. Uh, what was it called? I think it was called Grow Your Audience. And he actually developed the plugin, WP Complete. And I, I really liked, he had a really simple dashboard a bit like this. And you can mark lessons as complete as you go. You can track your progress. Uh, and I, it was just a really nice experience. And so I use that plugin, which lets me add these buttons to the page. And so I can, I can mark it as complete down here. And so that, that updates the dashboard as well. You can actually see it's tracking people's progress here. So I'm 6% complete and the lessons get marked off as well. So coming back to my Miro board. Um, yeah, I use the content restriction plugin to actually kind of lock the page and then WP complete to tick off those, to tick off those lessons or customers can tick off the lessons. Uh, Andrew, when building those modules, are they links to other pages or posts or are they pages? They are pages actually. Yeah, good question. So if I show you the, let's go into the pages here. So I'll take you to one of the courses, um, might be further along. Let's go to page four. So here we go. Actually, let's maybe not that far. Okay, so here we go. Here's an example. Here is my how to become a virtual consultant course. You see, I have the course dashboard page here. And then part one, the foundation and lesson 1.1 are actually sub pages of the course. So if I actually show you lesson 1.1, this is for my consulting program. You can see the, whoops, you can see the parent here. So it's, it's a sub or it's a child page of part one, which is actually a sub page of the course. So that it, all of the pages are actually built using the pages system within WordPress. They are all restricted as well. So you can see down here, this page is restricted to uh, customers. So that is the basically the e-commerce system of my website. Let me scroll along here. So that's all on my website. Uh, yeah, Stripe and PayPal kind of come off the back of that. Uh, and that's how, you know, obviously money gets paid into my bank account. So next, I want to move on and talk about my email marketing system. And uh, if you have questions as you go about e-commerce before I move on, please let me know. Yeah. So yeah, next let's talk about email marketing because that is another big kind of piece of the puzzle here. So actually you can basically see looking at this diagram, a lot of the arrows point to my email provider, which is ConvertKit. So firstly, on my website, I have various signup forms. So if I go to the about page, uh, Actually, I think I removed one from there. No, there's nothing on there at the moment. Oh, I do have, um, I do have the pop-up, which is through WriteMessage. I'll, I'll come back and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but sometimes across my website, you will see these various a sign-up form like this to you know, get help with your productivity tools. Or if I go to one of these pages, you can see there might be at the bottom, there's a sign-up form down here as well. Uh, these are actually built using WriteMessage, but when somebody subscribes using one of these forms, they end up in my email provider, which is ConvertKit. And ConvertKit, let's go there quickly. So ConvertKit, um, let's have a look. So with ConvertKit, if you go to the landing pages and forms tab, 
these are all of the forms, the opt-in forms that I've created for my website. Actually, they're not, not all of them are being used at the moment because I have replaced a lot of them with right message. But basically I can create a simple opt-in form. So if I go to, let's say this PB blog post, um, ConvertKit makes it really easy to design the layout of your form, uh, you know, the headlines, the images and things. I can choose what information I want to collect. And I can in the settings as well, I can even choose what happens when somebody uh, fills out the form. Uh, I've got that somewhere. Maybe they've changed it. Oh, actually, I know what I'm trying to show. Yeah. So they can fill out this form. Um, and then what you can do with automation. So if I go to the automations tab, you can create rules. So here I go. If I go to my rules now. Uh, and don't be intimidated, intimidated by this if it looks like a lot, if it's overwhelming. Um, <laughs> but I've got here are all of my productivity blueprint forms. So there's the PB blog post one that I was just on. When anyone signs up to one of these forms, the subscriber gets tagged with resource PB. Uh, so that, that is for my productivity blueprint, which then if I go to my automations, that will then trigger a sequence where I can say, right, um, when they have the tag added resource PB. So the form, they sign up for the form, the rule adds the tag, the tag starts this sequence. I can then perform a number of automations. So I can add them to my newsletter and I can start, I can enroll them into my productivity blueprint course. And, uh, and eventually the people will go into sales funnels and things. Um, I won't talk through all of this now. This is getting quite into the weeds, but basically the form allows me to trigger an automated sequence of emails, which I've set up here in ConvertKit. And so, yeah, like I've said in the notes here, I use tags to basically group people into different categories. So if I go back to, um, let's go back to ConvertKit. I have quite a lot of tags in my account that do various things, uh, some course tags that trigger different course updates, but I have some, my main tags are my newsletter ones here. So eventually when you sign up with me, you'll end up on my newsletter. I also have smaller newsletters for Asana and Pipedrive and so on. But I basically use tags to, categorize who should be getting what. Uh, the way ConvertKit is a little bit different from other tools like MailChimp, if you've ever used MailChimp, which I, I did use in the past, MailChimp, you can have multiple lists. So I can have a subscriber on different lists. With ConvertKit, you can actually, you only have one list. There's actually no such thing as a, as a list really in ConvertKit. Everyone's just sort of on one list and we use tags to group people into different categories and say, you know, just define what newsletters or types of emails people should get. So let's, let's talk about right message. So uh, last year when I switched to ConvertKit, I didn't use right message. I really just used the built-in forms. So the ones that I showed you before, I just used all these simple forms for collecting basically the first name and email address of every subscriber. I then got introduced to right message through Brennan Dunn's online course, uh, Mastering ConvertKit. I was getting started with ConvertKit and I wanted to learn more about it. So I took Brennan's course he introduces you to right message, which is a really powerful way of collecting more information about subscribers uh, so that you can actually personalize emails. So a good example of this is right here. It says, you know, this is an article about productivity. So I can ask people, what is the number one reason you want to be more productive? And I've got some common responses here. So I can say, you know, I want to be more effective in my business and grow more. And then I get this question, what is the number one issue that you struggle with in your business? And you can actually see because they ticked that previous question, I'm trying to be more productive in my business. This question now actually says, well, why do you want to be more productive in your business? It actually feels more personal. So I can say uh, maybe um, I get confused by technology. And then it says, great. Okay. Master your tools and download my blueprint um, to set up a basic system to be more organized in your business. So it's similar to a convert kit form, but I can ask people a couple of extra questions first. And so this information all goes into convert kit. So here's that right message form. Um, so right message is on my website. And when somebody signs up, the subscriber information goes into convert kit. How I can use that is uh, it's quite, quite clever. So let's go to maybe one of my automation sequences. Let's go to let's go to that productivity one that I was just on. And I'll have a look down here at 
one of my bridge sequences. This is for my sales funnel here. Oh, well, actually, no, let's, sorry, let, let's go back to the course. Let's go to one of these course emails. I've changed my mind. Uh, lesson one. I think I've got something in here. Yeah. So this is the email that they get when they, when they uh, fill out that form, this one here, they're going to get this first email that says, this is where you can download your blueprint. And I have a bunch of text here where if you look carefully, it has a bunch of these sort of conditional blocks where I can say, if your challenge, if your challenge that you struggle with is technology, I can say this, this particular sentence. But if you struggle with habits, I can say this. And so the actual content of the email is now more dynamic. It's still, I'm still sending the same email to everyone, but it just feels a little bit more personal. It feels a little bit more like I'm writing to the person saying, look, if you struggle with technology, this is how I think the, the toolkit will, uh, the, the blueprint will help. And so it just makes emails, instead of trying to design an email with the perfect copy and message, if the subscriber has told me, look, I struggle with technology, I can actually include content and messaging here that speaks to that particular goal or to that particular problem that the subscriber has told me that they struggle with. So that's a really, uh, that's really the use case of write messages is, uh, is I'm collecting more information about what people want help with. I can then use that to personalize my emails and you can even use it to personalize the content of your sales page. So if I go to the productivity blueprint now, let's go to that product page here. Uh, you see, I have this, um, I've actually got this custom headline because I've previously said, I want to learn about my tools. The headline says, learn how to master your tools and supercharge your productivity. Now, if I'd chosen a different response, maybe I, I struggle with building habits. This headline could be talk more to the habits that people struggle with. That, so that's the other thing that right message lets you do is that you can actually personalize the content of your website as well, based on what people have, have told me that they need, need help with. And uh, how, I, I was, how I was sort of um, first kind of came into contact with this is when I was signing up to Brennan's course, Mastering ConvertKit, I was reading about the course and it really spoke to me because he was talking about how the course would help me to be more productive and efficient and streamline my business because I'd previously told him through my opt-in that that's what I wanted to help with. And so I thought it was really funny that basically the reason I signed up for his course is because it really spoke to me and it, it, it appealed to my needs. Uh, and so that's essentially what I'm trying to mimic here. So that's the, that's ConvertKit and write message, which write message I would say is like a um, supporting tool that kind of sits between my website and my email. Um, and then we have deadline funnel as well. Deadline funnel is a tool that I use to run sales. So when you sign up to that email sequence, you'll get some emails about my blueprints and various videos and things. Eventually you make your way into a sales funnel where for a, a period of time, it's far, about five days, you get the opportunity to sign up to the course at a discount and you get some bonuses as well. Um, sorry, Andrew, just saw your question. Will there be an overview of your costs? Uh, yeah, I'll, let me, uh, I'll finish what I'm about to say and then I'll, I'll definitely start talking about costs a little bit, yeah. So with deadline funnel, I can basically say, right, when a subscriber starts the sale, I can change the content of the sales page. I can put in, you can see in this little screenshot here, let me zoom in there. Um, there we go. I can have deadline funnel add things like timers to the page. I can add extra content to the page for just for the duration of that sale. So basically deadline funnel is the, is the software that I use to run the sale. And then after the timer ends, once the four or five day sale ends, if somebody tries to click the link again to, to see the sale, uh, it will have, the sale would have expired. So deadline funnel is the tool that I use to, to run that. In terms of cost, Andrew, I think deadline funnel is about, uh, here, let me write some of these in. I think it's about 59 or $69 per month uh, for deadline funnel. ConvertKit, I would say, is you pay for the number of subscribers that you have. So obviously, the more you have, the more expensive it is. ConvertKit is by far my most expensive tool. I, I think it's about three. I think I'm on the 320 per month plan at the moment. Right message is 129 uh, per month. Um, and remember as well, you don't need right message. It's it's more of a it's more of a nice to have. I think it's worth it because it really allows me to personalize emails and the content of my page. Um, so you certainly don't need right message, 
and I, I definitely didn't in the beginning as well. I had, I didn't have deadline funnel either for years. I was running sales more manually and I didn't have this. This is a cost I've only started to pay in the last, uh, actually since the start of the year. So I would say, don't feel like you need to pay for all this software in the beginning. I started a lot simpler and I very much added on tools as I've, as I've progressed here. Um, my website, there's no cost for WordPress, uh, Cloudways. So WordPress. Oh, not typing here. What's going on? Yeah. Hang on a sec. WordPress is free and hosting is, I think it's about $24 per month or something like that. And e-commerce, yeah, like I said, this is, um, I think it's about $299 per year. So actually that's, that's really not bad. So that is ConvertKit, Write Message and Deadline Funnel. Um, so let me just check my diagram. Yeah. The, this big arrow here from e-commerce all the way down to ConvertKit. So I do have an add-on for, e, for easy digital downloads where when somebody pays, I can actually have them be tagged in ConvertKit. So if I actually go to the PPT download, so this is the download where I've set up my toolkit, the pricing, how it all works. Um, down here, uh, scrolling down here, here are all my ConvertKit tags. So I've said, when they buy this product, tag them with purchase PPT. So I've directly connected my e-commerce system to ConvertKit as well. So it will tag them. And as you can imagine, when I tag them, I can then trigger a thank you email, emails about the course and that type of thing. So that's this, that's this big arrow here. So the next block to talk about is I guess this section of the diagram here. So how I use Calendly along with Zoom, Pipedrive, and Asana. So Calendly is the tool that I use to take uh, bookings for new leads, people who are contacting me to get help with one-on-one -on -one consulting, uh, and they can just book me on my website. So it's on a page like uh, Asana Consulting. This button here, which actually is too big at the moment, there's a bit of a design issue going on, which I'm working on at the moment. But this book a call button, in the past, I linked it directly to Calendly. So you would get to a page like this, where you can book an introductory call with me. So you can say, right, um, you know, pay for a consulting intro call. And you can pick a time. What I've actually done more recently, this is, I would say, has been in the last three or four months, is I've actually now set up a system to qualify people more. So you can't book a call with me unless you kind of meet certain criteria. And I'm doing this using right message. So I'm uh, right message here. I'm, I'm looking at this, this arrow here. I can basically um, ask people some questions before they book a call with me. And let me, let me take you behind the scenes and show you the set up in right message. So here we go. Here we are in right message now. So when they click that button, so let me, uh, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit, but let's go back to here. So when they click this button, it launches the right message pop-up and it says, what is the size of your team using Asana? And so that's actually this first question up here. What is the size of your team using Asana? And I have my three responses that people can select. And so I basically ask people a number of questions. So what is the size of your team? What stage are you at with your use of Asana? What's your goal? What do you want to achieve with it? And then what kind of budget can you afford to work on this project? And so I can, I've kind of got some options here that really align with the pricing of my courses and one-on-one -on -one consulting. Now, based on the response, the budget response, I can send people down different paths. So if people say, you know, less than 397, I'm on a tight budget, I can actually say this, I can say, sorry, it looks like based on your budget, um, we won't be able to work together, but would you like to receive my newsletter? And then I can just send them a, an offer to sign up to my newsletter. Or if they say, yep, 400 to two and a half, um, it then says, great, would you like to book an introductory call with me? So they fill out their name and this gets their information into ConvertKit. And the way I've set this up is this will then redirect to Calendly and it will actually fill in with this, with this URL it will actually pre-populate their name and their email into Calendly. 
and uh, so they can then book that introductory call with me. So again, the simpler way to do this is, like I said, you can just link directly to Calendly. I'm now doing it a little, I've put in an extra step, which is that people have to answer these questions and I can um, qualify people. And I can, just like I did before with the toolkit, I can also personalize the emails that people get. So if they've inquired to get help with Asana and they want to you know, streamline their processes, I can send out emails related to that specific thing that they've told me. Once they book in Calendly, uh, a Zoom call is automatically created. So I've got some screenshots down here. In your, in your Calendly settings, I've basically just connected directly to my Zoom account. So um, just by them booking the call, a Zoom URL is created and gets added to the calendar invite. So the actual calendar invite that goes onto my calendar and the one that the customer gets or the client gets as well, we both have that Zoom link. I can also, in Calendly, I can take payments as well because I do have a, an option to book a priority slot. Um, I can actually connect that with Stripe and I can take a payment through Calendly. And so that's, that is this arrow here. So Calendly does connect to Stripe as well. So once they make that booking, new leads, people who are inquiring about my consulting service, they get added to Pipedrive, which is my sales CRM. And this is done through Zapier. Zapier is the automation tool that I use to kind of create that link. Uh, if you haven't heard of Zapier or come across Zapier before, it basically works on a trigger action system. So when somebody um, books the call with me, Zapier sees that happen and I've programmed Zapier. And by the word program, I don't mean writing code. It actually doesn't require any coding. Um, but I've told Zapier uh, you need to then create a new deal in Pipedrive, add in the information like their name, their email that type of thing. And so that puts them into my CRM. And so yeah, I'm talking about these notes here. So new inquiries go into Pipedrive. Um, when I, so I'm, I'm then managing my sales process in Pipedrive. You know, I'm having calls with people, finding out some information and I'm tracking follow up as well. If I need to follow up with somebody in a few weeks, I can set activities to do that. When I win a deal, if a client signs up, Zapier will also update their profile in my email system. So that's this arrow here. Uh, Zapier will um, update their, their subscriber profile and it'll say, right, you know, John has uh, signed up to Paul's Asana consulting program. So he's gonna get emails about my Asana program and he's gonna get my Asana newsletter as well. It will also um, create tasks for me in Asana. So Asana is my task management tool. Uh, so when I win a new deal, there are going to be some tasks that I have to do to onboard that new customer and book calls and things like that. So Zapier will actually create tasks for me in Asana. In terms of cost, uh, Andrew, Zapier is $15 per month. Pipedrive is for what? It's $25 per user per month. I mean, I'm just one user, so it's $25. That's for the advanced plan. You can go onto the professional as well, which I think is about $55 or $59 a month. Uh, but the $25 a month for the advanced is more than enough for me. Uh, Andrew, is ConvertKit or Pipedrive the master CRM that keeps track of everything that someone has done with you? Yeah, good question. Um, I would say, yeah, basically everyone that works with me, either they buy one of my products, like my toolkit, with my toolkit, there's no one-on-one -on -one consulting that comes with that. Um, but yeah, those customers are in there, in, in ConvertKit. But it, yes, it is the same with Pipedrive. For my one-on-one -on -one clients as well, they also go into ConvertKit because they will get my newsletters about Asana and Pipedrive. Um, so it's a nice way for me to keep in touch with clients is, you know, as I, when I make a new video about Asana, I can send it to my Asana newsletter, which will include all of my previous customers. So yes, I would say ConvertKit is the master, like every customer and client that I've worked with. Pipedrive is all of is purely clients. There are no um, so there are no normal subscribers in Pipedrive. To get into Pipedrive, you have to have made an inquiry to work with me about my consulting. Um, Michael was asking, so the connection to Zoom to Zapier to Pipedrive. Uh, so the connection to, is Zoom to Zapier to Pipedrive. Uh, not quite. It's actually Calendly to Zapier to Pipedrive. Zoom is integrated directly with Calendly. You don't need to use Zapier to connect um, Zoom and Calendly. Yeah, it's just built in, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's this screenshot here. So when you are setting up, in fact, I can, I can show you quickly. Um, 
So when you are setting up your booking type, let's show my account. Let's look at this one-on-one. -on -one. So when you are setting up the location, if I just remove that quickly, there are a bunch of locations like I can call them, I can say it's in person, or I can just choose Zoom and I just log into Zoom and it then is connected to my account. So then, yeah, when they book that call with me, I get the calendar invite on my calendar and it includes the Zoom link automatically. So there's no need to use Zapier to do that. Um, brilliant. So let's get back to this diagram. So let's just check my notes here. So I've used right message to get to Calendly. Um, yeah, something I didn't mention. I do also use Calendly to schedule you know, my existing clients, not just new leads, but clients that I'm working with one-on-one. -on -one. They can also use Calendly to schedule time with me. They, those bookings get added to my Asana account. And again, that is done through Zapier. So you know, if I'm working with Dave and he books a one-on-one, -on -one, that creates a task for me in Asana. And so it's just a way that I can track my calls with people in my task management system. And as well, because sometimes somebody will email me before an appointment and say, hey, Paul, here are some questions I'd like to talk about today. I can actually add those to the task in Asana. So I've kind of got my notes happening there as well. Uh, yep, yeah, as I mentioned, so Calendly are linked with Zoom. The nice thing about Calendly as well is it does send reminder emails before the call. So you get a reminder 24 hours before uh, that says, you know, just a reminder your call with Paul is tomorrow. Uh, the appointment gets added to both of our calendars as well, which is great. Uh, so I've connected it with my Google Calendar, which actually I then view using the Apple Calendar, Apple, uh, Apple Calendar. And it means actually if I change the appointment on my Apple Calendar, if I need to reschedule, I can change it on my Apple Calendar. That will then update on the client's calendar as well, which is really nice. So Pipedrive, as I mentioned, yeah, is where I manage the sales process, the new inquiries, and Asana is for managing day-to-day -day work, client work, things like planning content. And it is, yeah, like I said, linked with Pipedrive and Calendly through Zapier. So I think that is everything. Um, obviously, well, it's not everything. I would say there are more tools that I use that aren't listed here, um, but they're not really crucial parts of the system. I would say these are the main kind of building blocks where different things are linked together and um, how everything kind of flows back and forth. So that is sort of the official end of me explaining everything here. If anyone has any other questions, please let me know in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself as well. And I'm happy to stick around and answer additional questions that people have. Yeah, Andrew, so is Pipedrive the best way to work between Pipedrive and Asana? I think I think so. So Pipedrive does have a native integration with Asana, but to be honest, it's not very good. All it does is creates like a blank project or a blank task. The reason I choose to use Zapier is I can actually duplicate a template with Zapier or I can create a sequence of tasks. So I can create a list of tasks in Asana. So yeah, the native integration is just quite simple. It's quite straightforward. You can do a lot more with Zapier. Uh, and there's Integromat as well, actually. I, I've never used Integromat. Integromat is basically a, an alternative to Zapier. It's an automation tool that sits between different systems. Um, as I understand it, they're pretty similar, but because I've already started using Zapier, I'm kind of comfortable just working with that. Thanks for answering all my questions. It's really cool to, uh, that you're, I thought this was gonna be like a fake uh, webinar. So the fact that you're actually here it's really cool. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Yeah, I, I much prefer to do these things for real. I don't do a lot of webinars, so when I do them, I, I prefer to yeah, make them real. Yeah. Can I ask one more? Uh, what? So if I am interested in figuring out the best integrations between Pipedrive and Asana, um, do you recommend your Pipedrive course, your Asana course, or just private consulting? And is it, or is it just a budget question? Yeah, I'm, I guess it depends a little bit on what are you trying to do between those two tools? Um, so I run a marketing and for our startup, we have um, leads come in through Pipedrive off the website. Yeah. And when we're going, like, there's a lot of things that have to happen when we're onboarding someone. So when a deal is moved from one in one part of Pipedrive to another, it'd be great if certain triggers were made in Asana. Um, like certain tasks got created or um, when, when a deal is won, you'd want like a whole onboarding 
uh, module to be made up in Asana, so that kind of thing. Yeah, um, well, certainly, I mean, in terms of the courses that I have, certainly the Pipedrive course would uh, be a good fit to teach you that. I mean, obviously, it covers quite a lot more, but there is um, lessons on automation. So you could probably have quite a simple Zapier workflow where you say there is actually a trigger where you can say when a Pipedrive deal gets to a certain stage, that can be a trigger. And then you can have the Zap set to then create a task in a specific project in Asana. Um, so it should be, should, should be a fairly straightforward one to do. Yeah. Yeah. It should be possible. Um, so you're recommending check out your pipe drive course as opposed to it being a little more complex and worthy of, a maybe start there and then look into consulting if that makes sense. I would say start there. I mean, with my course, yeah, I don't know how much of a look of it you've had. Um, there's the monthly or the unlimited option. You could even just start for a month and, uh, you'd get access to my group calls. So if you do get stuck, I'm more than happy to help you. Um, if it, it depends how complex it is. If you're wanting to add tasks to a specific client project and it's a little bit more dynamic, there might be a few extra steps there. But yeah, certainly I think the course is a good start and um, I'd be able to help you with that as well, yeah. Thanks. All right, uh, thank you. Um, Michael, I uh, saw posted a question. So when someone schedules a follow-up call through Calendly, do all the future calls for that person get logged in Pipedrive via Zapier? Uh, schedule a follow-up call through Calendly. Oh, so Michael, I think you mean um, when they become a client, if they schedule like a one-on-one -on -one private session with me, do they get logged in Pipedrive? Is, is that what you're asking? Yes. Uh, so I, I don't have it set up that way, but you could do. Uh, I prefer to have them go into Asana because Pipedrive is really for managing the sales process for me. Um, once they become a client, I manage them in Asana. So there's kind of a, quite a clear dividing line between where Pipedrive ends and Asana begins. How, that's how I do it. However, some people have used just Pipedrive for their entire journey. You could do the sales process and the client follow-up and management in Pipedrive. Equally, you could, do, you could have a CRM project in Asana and you could manage clients in Asana. I prefer to use both. Uh, I prefer to use the right tool for the right job. Pipedrive is a great CRM. It's got great reporting that Asana doesn't have but Asana is better for like projects. So I prefer to use both. Um, so yeah, you, you could absolutely, if you wanted to do that in Pipedrive, you could have a trigger where, yeah, when they booked that private session, it gets logged on their deal um, or their contact in Pipedrive, yeah. Uh, so Michael, yeah, once they are one, they move to the pipeline to Asana. So how do you keep them organized in Asana? Yeah, I, I basically have a project for all clients. So, um, uh, let me go to maybe my, I'll just go to my demo account. I won't show you my, my real one, <laughs> but um, I do something a bit like this. So, I mean, how you set up your projects, your clients in Asana may differ. Like some people do a project for each client, a bit like how I have here, Apple and Tesla and SpaceX. You know, each client is a project essentially. Um, you could, and this is how I do it, I have one project for every client where instead of having a project for a client, I have each client be a task. So I can have here Michael White, and then I have my calls here as subtasks. So I say Michael White, call one hour. So this is how I do it. Um, so once they want, yeah, so to answer your question, when they're one, Zapier adds them to this project. It creates a new parent task like this. And then I have another zap where when they book a one-on-one -on -one call, it creates a subtask on the parent task. That's basically how I do it. And so it does that by email address? Like it identifies them uniquely by their email address or I, uh, I guess that's the part I'm curious about. How does it keep them organized? Yeah, you could use email. I actually just do it by their name, um, which can run into issues like <laughs> If I've got you as Michael White, but you then book your call as Mike, uh, it can run into issues. But more, like 90% of the time, um, their name is fine. I, I make sure that I name the task uh, however they prefer to write their name. So if you use Mike more than you use Michael, I'll write it as Mike. Right. Yeah. No, actually, so with a name like Michael White, you can imagine the fear of having somebody else with my name. That's rather yeah. common here in the States. <laughs> Well, it only, I guess it would only be an issue if I'm working with two Michael Whites, but uh, I mean, I, I don't think that's happened to me yet where 
two people with this identical name have worked with me. I, I hope that happens to you. I hope you have that many clients that that happens to you, my friend. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, you could use email. I mean, email would probably be a more reliable way to do it. So I could have in here, you know, mike at email.com. And that way um, I could look up the task by, um, by your email address. But yeah, how you do clients in Asana kind of depends. Like I would say, you know, for a lot of my get engagements, which are smaller, you know, it's a number of one-on-one -on -one sessions. I'll do it as a task. If a project is really big, you know, you may want to set up like an actual project for that client so that you can take advantage of things like the timeline and you've just got more space to plan out the entire project. So um, yeah, how you set up your clients may, may be different. Brilliant. Hey Paul, right. Amy here. Hey Amy. I've got a question back on courses and course delivery. Yeah. Um, when, when you, I know you use WP, WP Complete and EDD. Yeah. Did you look at other dedicated LMS plugins? Um, and if so, what made you choose this? It, it seems like a, forgive me, it seems like a little bit more manual route, but maybe it's more controllable or customizable. Yeah, I would say, I would say that's a fair summary, a fair statement, and one of the reasons I chose to use this. So there are some other third-party course platforms like um, Teachable is one that comes to mind, or Kajabi, which are great mm -hmm. for online courses. The reason I chose to uh, keep it within my system is, I mean, partly to have everything, I really like having everything under one roof. And so I wanted to try and find a way of still having payments go through EDD. That way I, I have one list of customers and one place to look at payments, which is in EDD, rather than if I had some of my products sold through EDD and others which are courses sold through Teachable, I now kind of have two databases. I've got, yeah, the EDD and the Teachable ones. And it, feel, it felt like it would be a little bit more messy having those two separate kind of tools. And so my first reaction was, yeah, can I find a way to do this with EDD? And I did find a way to do it, which is through the content restriction add-on. Mm -hmm. It does, and it, 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 I mean, I like that as well. Not only does it mean I have all my payments in one system, so then if you sign up to my toolkit, that's a one-time payment, that's through EDD. But if you sign up to my course, that's still in EDD. I've got one place to look at all of the payment history for one person. But also it means that all of my course is actually set up in WordPress as well. So as I showed you before, like the course dashboard, the lesson pages, it all lives in mm -hmm. WordPress. I don't have to manage that on a separate platform. Um, so that was, that was probably the main reason I chose to house it all under EDD and with, with WP complete. It, it, it is Great. probably a bit trickier to set up. I think you're right. Like, cause you have to, uh, design kind of the layout of the page and the sidebar and everything mm -hmm. where tools like Teachable and Kajabi probably make that a lot easier. Um, but I was happy to kind of take on the extra work to have it the way I want. Yeah. Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Um, Michael, have another call. Been a fan of you. Oh, thank you, Michael. And uh, nah, thank you. Thanks for joining. And Andrew, at the end of the year for taxes, does all your revenue get tracked through EDD or is it Stripe and PayPal? Do you have any other way of getting analytics on how each course is doing? Yeah, good question, Andrew. Um, so for tax purposes, yeah. So like payments go out through Stripe and PayPal. That then goes into my, my New Zealand bank account. And actually on that topic, so I do charge in US dollars, uh, obviously because most of my customers are in the United States, but Stripe and PayPal payments, they all come into my New Zealand bank account, um, which is all in New Zealand dollars. So my New Zealand bank account is connected to Zero. Zero is the uh, accounting software that I use. And basically every transaction, like so every payment that comes from Stripe or PayPal, Zero sees that. And same with my expenses as well. I have a credit card, which I use to pay for all of these tools. And so Zero sees every expense and every bit of income for my business. And so all of my taxes are, uh, are done in New Zealand dollars through there. And I have an accountant that sorts that for me. I don't, I don't try and do that myself. Um, with analytics, <clears throat> in terms of how the courses are doing, I kind of have a number of, number of ways of seeing it. EDD do give you some reports. I can see the total sales for a course. Um, but also in Deadline Funnel, they can show me weekly how the sales funnels are performing. Um, I've got Google Analytics on my website as well <clears throat> that tracks revenue for the website. So, uh, I mean, the main one that I use is probably the e-commerce, the EDD reporting, but I actually have a couple of ways that I could track that revenue. Yeah. 
and how do we get a copy of the whiteboard? Yeah, um, I will. Um, I'm going to put the recording and I'll summarize this in a bit of a blog post. I'll put that up on my website and I'll include a link to this Miro board as well. But no, thank you for joining. <clears throat> Can't thank you enough. It's really nice to meet you. I've been following you for a while and uh, really appreciate your generosity. Take care. Oh, thank you so much. No, that, mean, that means a lot. Thank you, Andrew. Same here. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Yeah, just keeping an eye on the chat. Let me know if there's any other final questions. <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, yeah, we can wrap up there. Okay, thank you, Paul. This uh, Asana, how we can use in our personal purpose? How can you use Asana for your personal purpose? Um, I guess that's a, that's a big question. I mean, uh, somebody's drawing all over my screen. How do I stop? <laughs> I don't know where these blue lines are coming from. Um, you, well, I would say, number one, have a look on my YouTube channel. I have loads of videos about how to use Asana. Um, I would start by thinking about, you know, what are the big projects that you're working on, either personally or professionally, and start to plan out what are those big areas or big, you know, areas of responsibility or big projects that you're working on. And then you can start to break those down into, uh, uh, you know, the actual tasks and things you need to do on a daily basis. Asana's got great features like the timeline and setting recurring tasks as well. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely have a look at my YouTube channel where I've got lots of videos on how to get started with Asana as well. <clears throat> okay, thanks. And another question is, uh, can you use the uh, email, email automate using the Asana also? You you could, you'd need to use something like Zapier. So I've done this before with clients where maybe when a task is completed, you could use that to trigger an email to be sent. Um, so that feature, it's not built into Asana, but it would be possible using something like Zapier. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we, we have to take this all uh, training in with you, uh, with your set or how? Oh, you certainly don't have to. I mean, I've got training and courses that do help you to learn more about Asana and teach you about automation. Um, but, you know, I always recommend, you know, have a look at Zapier, see if you can figure it out first and let me know when you get stuck. And uh, yeah, the training is there if you need it. Okay, well, thank you. I'll join thank you. Later. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> All right. Well, if there's no more questions, yeah, I'll uh, I'll wrap things up there. And uh, I mean, every, most people have logged off now, but thanks to those who are left. Thanks for joining. And this has been a lot of fun. Hopefully it's been useful. And uh, yeah, replays and everything will be available on my site later on. Great. Thank you. Take care. Yeah.